Welcome back to the Oracle Sports Podcast. I'm Oracle Sports Editor Nolan Brown. And I'm Hannah Halili. And we have a really, really packed show today. A really interesting guest that we have uh, later on down toward the end of the show. But for now, there's a lot of news to break apart. And I just want to dive right into it. So obviously, in the wake of, of George Floyd's death, there's there's been a lot of outspoken uh, talk from athletes, from coaches and whatnot. A lot of coaches are making statements. A lot of athletes are making statements. And, you know, it's just been a lot of general support basically for it. Um, I want to move a little bit to USF now. Also, just before we recorded, I tell you, all this stuff just happened right before. Um, we saw USF football's KJ Sales. He announced that he would be leading a march um, this Saturday um, from Franklin, North Franklin Street, downtown Tampa, to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, that's you know just about a mile and a half away. He called that all USF athletics um, personnel, family, he called them, um, all UT athletics personnel and Tampa youth sports and high school sports, just kind of a, a mass call to everyone. And within minutes, he got, you know, quote tweets from the likes of USF women's basketball coach, Jose Fernandez. He said, my family and I will be there. Uh, he got a quote tweet from Jeff Scott, basically saying that he'll tr try and be there as well. Um, Jordan McLeod said he would join in. This could be really big. I mean, this is something interesting that we're seeing from a player this is the first time I think I mean we saw with Jordan McLeod earlier this weekend where he went out on Fowler we saw that champs burn down um, I want to say it was Saturday night honestly the days are kind of just running together at this point um, but he went out with his brother and a few other players his brother plays for the Buffalo Bills um, in the NFL or did play with them um, product of Clemson and they went out and they cleaned up. So that was one of the first actions that we saw from a USF player. And now we're seeing KJ uh, actually kind of take action and say he's going to lead this, this march, basically. And so it's, it's a really interesting development. And it's, it's really big because a lot of athletes and coaches have kind of just put their input in. And so mm -hmm. I think it could be really big. I think it could, and I think it will. And I think it'll make a lot of impact. And, you know, in his little, not for little, but in his announcement, I like what he said. He said sports is a unifier. And it's true. I, you know, when you're on a team or when you're playing a sport and you're relying on other individuals, it brings you together. And I feel like right now is a very important time to come together, you know, not only as a school, but he called the rest of Tampa. It's our whole community. And with everything been going on in Tampa, It'd be interesting and nice to see USF athletics just being with other athletic teams in the Tampa area. So I'm excited. So, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to see that he called it the unifier and especially if people from UT come out, I mean, UT is not, they say UT is kind of a rival of USF because they're in the same city. Not really the case. I mean, I know men's soccer, they have the Rowdies cup every year, yeah. but that's not really that big but it, to see that kind of come together and if these schools come together and then the local schools jump into like this is really pivotal and especially with KJ's nickname I mean they call him the mayor of Tampa and it's kind of a nickname that he adopted himself and he's actually spoken with Mayor Jane Castor um, about these issues and to see that he's taking these steps to to lead this march it's really important for what he's doing and you know he said before that he's trying to to get into some sort of office eventually i mean this is putting him on the map as this sort of leader we've seen him on the field as a leader we've seen him at usf as a leader but now that he is going out into the community this is really crucial for him and really solidifies him as a leader yeah for sure and it just overall brings usf and our community just closer together as we fight what's going on and we, you know, combat these ob obstacles and, you know, make change for what needs to be done. 
and it's affected everyone. It's affected all of us. And just to come together as athletes, I think is going to be very powerful. And it's gonna be very nice to see. I'm <laughs> and Jordan McLeod, he he retweeted what KJ said and he jumped in. He said he'll be there. Um interesting also again within just minutes before we recorded, um, we saw that he actually met with Tampa Mayor Jane Castor today. Um I don't know what they discussed. Nobody really knows, but he said um, that they talked a little bit about moving forward and steps to to take into Tampa. And to, so to see two USF players kind of take that burden of of being a leader in their own community and and taking it into action, that is so crucial. And you know, we talk a lot about. Well, I say we. I mean, the whole community talks a lot about Team Tampa Bay, and you know, they talk about. USF, they talk about the lighting, they talk about the rays, and seeing these groups come together and trying to make some sort of impact and seeing it, especially from USF athletes, is is really is really cool to see. I'm, I'm gonna just say it, it's it's a cool thing to see that USF athletes are coming out and they're trying to support. It's definitely going to be something super cool, especially with just like you mentioned, the hub that Tampa is for sports. And I just, I love what he said, like it's unifying and we're coming together and fighting, say we, USF, and just everyone else. And, you know, more things to come, you know, follow us on Twitter if you haven't already at USF Oracle Sports. We'll be retweeting and covering more of these topics that we're talking about just to stay more updated. Because as we said, these all just happened as we started recording. So that's the only, pretty much the only information we have about right now. But, you know, who knows what's to come. Yeah, and so we'll be looking forward, looking forward to that. I know I'll be out there on Saturday. Um, I'll be covering, <clears throat> sorry, mm, we need a cough button or something. <laughs> <clears throat> My bad. Um, I'll be out there on Saturday. I'll be covering what KJ is doing. Um, I'll get some quotes and things like that, and we'll get a story out of it. But it's it's going to be really interesting to see, and I'm, I'm looking – forward to seeing who's going to show up and, and what the support is going to be but um, we want to switch gears uh, we want to get into our guest I know we've kind of taken up a lot of time already um, but we have a, a very interesting uh, guest and it was kind of a not really a last minute thing I mean we kind of talked about it before but uh, we actually have a captain of the USF Sundals uh, we talked with her Lauren Farr uh, she's a third year vet um, just to get her take on on what's happening with you know on the on the other side of things and um, you know, getting sort of uh, getting ready for a season that you know we don't know how it's going to play out. So I think it's a really interesting take on on how Sundals are preparing for the season ahead and and what kind of challenges they're facing. And so we'll get into that one. Um, Hannah actually leads this one, so we'll get into it. Hi everyone. So today our guest is a very special guest and a little bit different than who we normally interview. And she is the captain of the Sundolls. Uh, she's also a third year veteran and her name is Lauren. Hi. <laughs> um, so Lauren, I just want to know what have you been doing during your time home in quarantine with all of this going on? So when we first heard that we were going to be quarantined and our season was pretty much over. Um, I stayed in Tampa for about a month and I was kind of just hanging tight because I was kind of hoping, part of me was hoping that maybe it would be over really fast and we would, we would be able to go back to campus. Um, and then obviously as the days went on, I realized that wasn't going to happen. So I went back home. Um, I'm originally from the Florida Keys. So I went back home and visited my parents for a little while. And then I came back to Tampa um, it was audition season for the Sundolls and we had to do something a little bit different because we were in quarantine. So we did all of our auditions completely virtual, which was really weird for me because like auditions are one of the best parts of the year. It's so fun. Um, and we didn't even really get to meet the girls who were auditioning. So it was kind of like everyone was in the dark and no one really knew what was going on. Um, so that happened and then our team got announced and since then we've all been on like a workout regimen. Um, we've been starting to talk about nutrition and what we should be fueling our bodies with. Um, so 
that's what's been going on currently. <laughs> How is that tryout process affected by it? I know, I mean, you want to see everyone in person. You kind of want to see them do their thing, but then you're going to see it through a video. And is it a little bit different, harder to judge, basically? Um, it is. I was not on the judging side. Um, veterans do have to try out every single year. Our spot's not guaranteed at all. It doesn't matter if you're a second year or a fourth year veteran, you have to audition again. But for us anyways, like we love to interact with the new incoming rookies. Um, and that also plays a big part in the selection process. Our coach does like to kind of like peer out and see how the rookies are interacting with the vets and how the vets are interacting with the rookies. Um, and I know my rookie year, they asked me in my interview process during auditions, which vets have you talked to? Who's been helpful to you um, during this audition process? So um, it is kind of important to be able to interact with these new people. So that was really weird, not being able to do that, not even knowing who's sending in videos. Like we had no idea. Um, so that was really different. And then also it's challenging for people to find space to film their videos. I know I was lucky enough that I had my home studio that I could go to that was open, but other people were in their backyard or in their garage. And that's not always like the best place for, for dance. Um, so we made it work, but it was definitely weird. And it did, I think it affected everyone a little bit. In a video, you can do things as many times as you want to get it perfect. In an in-person audition, you have one shot. And if you mess it up, you mess it up. So. That was a little bit different this year, but all in all, we ended up with a great team, so I'm really excited about it. Speaking of the team, when you're a dancer and you're performing group routines, it's really important to just perform together. And do you guys always do these group routines on the sidelines or, you know, during oh. or anything? So because of COVID-19 and just being away from each other, has it been different to, you know, practice, you know, sporadically it's a lot different than practicing all together and you know how have you guys compensated for that or do you think this will affect you guys future in the season yes so usually for us um we don't really start our season as a team until the end of july that's the first time we all meet together um, and we have a week-long practice usually it's at the end of july the last week the first day is our photo shoot which is super fun especially when you're a rookie because you come in and you're like you're on this sundial high because you're getting your hair and makeup done and there's photographers and you have someone helping you pose and you're all tan and it's so cool and then the rest of the week is drilling our sidelines learning our material um for the season for our halftime performances our quarter break performances um but behind the scenes in june and july our captains are actually learning those routines um, we go to this camp called All Pro. Um, it's put on by Pro Dance, and usually it's in Atlanta. And it's pretty much like all professional teams. There's very few college teams that go. Um, so that's a really cool experience for us to be in that atmosphere. Um, so usually that's where we learn our material for the season. And then we bring that back and we would teach it to the rest of the team. So this year, we've actually been doing weekly Zoom meetings, and they started like the week after our team was announced, which is kind of cool, because normally we wouldn't really interact with each other in this way until July. So now we're doing these weekly meetings. Um, we've had two or three with our coaches, and now we've branched off into smaller groups um, with the two captains, and we are going over our sideline material. Um, via Zoom and we're just having discussions about our fitness and our nutrition. So it's actually, I think, going to be a little bit more beneficial because we're actually interacting earlier on. Um, and we are hoping to meet again in August all together as a group in person. That's our goal. Yeah, actually. Oh, sorry, Nolan. No, go ahead. Um, I had a question about your guys' conventions. Like you said, that's where you learn all your material. Did any of them get canceled or pushed back just because of COVID-19? Because I know in dance conventions, there's like hundreds and hundreds of people like all together and you kind of have to like squish all together to learn <laughs> routines and everything. So how has that been affected by the pandemic? Um, so the one that we go to in Atlanta has been, it's been pushed to be completely virtual. So okay. the captains will still be learning the material um, at that same time that we would be in the end of June, but it's gonna be online. Um, so that's kind of weird because I'm going to be on my computer for like five hours learning dances. Um, but 
but our other camp, it's also put on by Pro Dance, and that would be in Vegas, and it's in July, and we have not been to that, um, that particular camp yet, but it's kind of the same concept as the one in Atlanta. It's the same company. Um, as of right now, they haven't announced if it's going to be online or not, but per the university, we will not be traveling there um, because they did send out that until further notice, July, like we have to be quarantined till the end of July. So um, that we're not going to be attending, but if it's virtual, we will be attending online. <laughs> There's a lot of talk about you know, we're not sure how the season is going to be in terms of football or even looking ahead at basketball seasons and later on down the road. Um, what will that do to, to your performances at these events? I know we've seen, uh, like with the NFL draft, we had, you know, some cheerleaders and dancers that were on Zoom and they were just kind of, you know, <laughs> sporadically throughout. Um, we've seen in like Korean baseball, they're, you know, standing six feet apart and they're doing their own routines. How will that, do you have any sort of idea about how that'll affect you if, you know, whatever measures they take? Um, so we are still kind of in the dark. We're waiting just like everyone else is from athletics. Um, they haven't really given us an idea. And I don't even know if it's really up to the university or if it's up to the NCAA. Um, so we're just kind of hanging out and waiting. As of right now, we're preparing as if kickoff is going to be when it's set to be. Um, that's what we're preparing for. And if for some reason it gets pushed back, we have to adapt. Um, for us, basketball season is very busy. Sundals um, are a little bit different than cheer when it comes to basketball season because we do men and women's basketball. All girl cheer usually does women's and then co-ed cheer does men's. So they get to split that up and there's a lot more of them. So they don't have as many games we only have two teams that split up and we do every single like men and women's game. So if for some reason football got pushed back and it was like colliding with basketball, it would be absolutely insane, but we would have to adapt because that's, that's our job. Our job is to be there and we've been taught to treat Sundals like a job. So if that's what we're told to do, that's what we're going to do. And then in the midst of it, we'll also be preparing for nationals. Um, which would be like right after spring break. So it would be busy if it got pushed back. So we're hoping that doesn't happen. But as of right now, we're preparing for everything to go as planned normal. You're mentioning that you guys are preparing and you're getting yourselves ready if the worst case scenario did happen. Can you describe some of those ways that you guys are preparing for those scenarios? Yeah, so um, our coach is trying to be as positive and upbeat as possible. We're really not trying to say like, oh, football's not going to happen or basketball's not going to happen. We're kind of just acting like it's going to be completely normal. So right now we're started cleaning our sideline routines with our rookies. Um, we have quite a few sideline routines and usually we send them out um, via like a YouTube channel and the rookies have to learn all those sidelines. And then the first day of practice in July is like the first time we see them doing it. But right now we're seeing them do it on Zoom and we can clean and have them better prepared for the season because we really don't know what's gonna happen and we don't even know if we're gonna be able to meet before school starts. So right now we're just trying to make sure everything is ready to go in case of us not having the opportunity to meet in person until the first game day. Like we have no idea what's going on. So right now we're just doing our very best. <laughs> We're seeing in some cases that people are speculating if certain things are going to stick around even, you know, after this passes or potentially for a second wave or whatever, but certain rules and certain like law changes and things like that. Do you think that as, as a, you know, supporters of, of people out in, you know, football and basketball games and especially with the Sun Dolls, do you think that sort of thing will change in the future, maybe permanently? I hope that's not the case because there there's no feeling like standing in a, a crowded stadium and seeing it from the field and looking up and seeing all those fans and it would be so weird the atmosphere would be so different if there was like oh we can only fill stadiums at 25 percent capacity for forever or we're not going to have cheerleaders and dancers anymore like that would be absolutely <laughs> terrible for us but um I hope that's not the case. 
Um, I do know that some NBA teams and NFL teams have started cutting their cheerleaders and dancers from their programs before COVID even started just because they have either they don't see the use for them or there's like a, a sexist um, a sexist issue so they kind of get rid of that so our industry is always kind of up in the air um i hope that there's no laws that prevent us from being there but um if it does i would be sad <laughs> that's all i'll say about that yeah especially because college football and just football in general cheerleaders and dancers i feel are a huge part of the culture and it just makes the experience more fun, you know, being surrounded by fans and the music, the band, and just seeing all of that. And I want to know your opinion, because we've been kind of been talking about it. Is it, do you think it'll be worth keeping sports around if our culture is changing based around the pandemic, you know, the potential of cutting cheerleaders or dancers, or, you know, even having the audience size down to like 25%, like you said? I absolutely think that we should keep sports around. I don't think there's any need to get rid of sports just because we can't have a full house or we can't have the band or cheerleaders or whatever. Because really from like the the dancers point of view, we know that the fans are there for football. We know that they're there for basketball. They're there to watch a game. Um, we add to like the special effects where they're, it, it sounds bad, but a lot of people just see us there for to take pictures with and smile and look good on camera. For us, it's much more than that. We're definitely, we feel like we're athletes. We know we're athletes. What we do is hard. Um, but just because we can't be there, I don't think that sports should change and we should just cancel them all together. Um, people love football. They love basketball. They love volleyball. They love everything about sports. And I don't think we should just get rid of them and, take them off the grid just because the culture changes. Some leagues um, like soccer leagues over in Europe on the TV broadcast, they're pumping in, you know, sort of fabricated audio. And a lot of broadcasters have been against it because they say, you know, it changes the the flow of the game and it kind of messes with things artificially. Um, and there's some talk that they might bring it over into the United States. And if a football game will have to be played without any fans or with minimal fans that they might just pump in this audio. And a lot of broadcasters are, are against it, American broadcasters. Um, how would that affect how you guys perform out there if you're having this sort of pumped in audio and artificial audience noise? So for us, um, we are trained to watch the game, watch the play. And we respond when it's positive for our team. And if it's not, we stay facing the field and we smile. We're always smiling. Um, so usually it's kind of based for us. Sometimes we can't see what's going on on the field because there's people, there's cameras, there's so much going on in front of us that we don't always see through the field. So sometimes you have to rely on the fans behind you. If they're cheering because something good is happening, we know that we're supposed to turn around and get excited with them. And if there's fake audio coming in, I feel like that could be really confusing for if you don't really know what's going on in the game and there's some fake audio coming in, that could be really confusing and awkward for us. Um, and also just the performance quality. There's something about performing for a group of fans versus just performing to, to nothing. I know that I am a completely different performer when there's 10,000 people in front of me versus, you know, just one person like my coach, you know, like I, I really turn on the charm when I see all those people. And so I think it could affect our performance quality too, if there's just fake audio and there's really nothing going on in the crowd and we're looking at empty seats. I want to so, oh, go ahead. You do this all the time. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. For the possibility of facing an unusual fall and winter sports season, you talked about how you guys are ready to adapt, but you are also captain. So are there any goals that you want to accomplish or maybe want to lead the team to work for or any goals like that in regards to the pandemic or not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, me and my other captain, Emily Creek, um, she's great. She's a fourth year. She's our only fourth year. Um, we've talked a lot about just trying to remain positive and um, our attitude really feeds down to the rest of the team. So if we come into the first day of practice, upset or it's very clear that we're 
angry because our senior year is over because we don't have football or whatever, it's going to feed down into the rest of the team and everyone, everyone else's attitude is going to be bad. So my main goal personally is to be as positive as possible. Always encourage my teammates to do their hundred percent best, even though our future is uncertain, we need to prepare like it's going to happen the way it's supposed to happen. And if we don't, I think that could be like detrimental to the vibe of our team. We have to be cohesive and we all need to be positive. And if we're not, that could be really bad. So that, that's me and my other captains, like personal goal is to just be as positive as we can, be as uplifting as we can, and also be a resource to the rest of our team, especially the rookies coming in. They're coming in at such a weird time. It's going to be completely different for them. Even our coaches, like no one really knows what's going to happen. So it's just really important for us to be flexible and positive so that we can get through this and adapt to whatever NCAA throws at us or the university. I want to think back to earlier in the basketball season where you and Michael Kelly came out into the center of the floor, the whole group, the Sun Dolls, and he was in that tracksuit jacket and he just busted a move. And it was an incredible experience, I think, for everyone there and for media as well. How did that come about? I just want to hear the story of that. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so the Sun Dolls appreciate Michael Kelly to no end. I cannot <laughs> say enough amazing things about him. Just like not even as an athletic director, but as a person, he is just so kind and wonderful. And he's always been great to us since the day he walked in. Um, so we've always had like a little soft spot in our heart for Michael Kelly. Um, last year, our one of our captains, Hannah, um, she was the only fourth year on the team at the time. And she and Michael Kelly kind of developed this like great personal relationship. And we do this athlete dance every year. And the Sundals will ask um, athletes from other teams, so basketball, football, um, soccer, golf, um, co-ed cheer. We ask athletes, whatever, whoever we want to ask, and we bring them in and we teach them a dance. And that's something we do every year. And it was Hannah and our coach's idea to invite Michael Kelly to dance with us and no one knew except for Hannah and the coaches. Hannah had told us that she got Blake Barnett to dance with her and we were all like really shocked because we were like how did you get Blake Barnett to agree to come and dance with us and because you know he's his personal life is busy enough and we were so confused and then the day of the practice Michael Kelly walks in and everyone like is losing their mind and even all the athletes, all the athletes were so supportive of him coming in and doing that. And he had a great time. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how it came about. And I hope he wants to do it next year because he was the star of the show. And now he has like his own like little gif or gif. I don't know what you guys say. I say gif, but he has like his own little gif um, of him dancing. He's doing this move. And it's just so cute, but um, that's how it came about, and he really enjoyed it. We loved having him. We couldn't thank him enough for coming. Um, so if he's listening, I hope you come back, Mr. Kelly, because you were a superstar. GIF is the correct way to say it. I'm going to go out and just say okay, it like I that. say GIF. I don't say, because I think GIF, I think like peanut butter. Exactly, yeah. But just oh to follow, go if ahead, sorry. If you're listening to this, please tweet us the GIF of Michael Kelly. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I'll try and dig for it. Just a, a final question from me, and then if Hannah has anything, I'll pass it over to her. Um, having that support from Michael Kelly, I know you spoke so highly of him, and a lot of you know athletes have said how wonderful he is, and even some media people, I'm not going to say anyone, but I mean, how is important is that having that support from, from Michael Kelly with the Sundolls, with the cheerleaders? How important is that? For us, it just makes us feel so much more included. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, Sundolls and Cheer, we are kind of considered a part of athletics, but we're in our own category under spirit squads. So we're really not athletes, even though like if we look at our transcripts, it says student athlete, but in athletics eyes, we aren't always necessarily considered athletes. We're considered spirit squads. And Michael, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. We, they're calling it like they see it. That's what we are. 
but Michael Kelly makes us feel so included. Um, he is so supportive of everything we do. And it's just nice to have someone who's on the inside and someone who's that high up support us and believe in us because it does make us feel a lot better um, at other schools, not at USF necessarily, but I have friends who dance at other schools and they tell me like, oh yeah, like we're not even considered athletes at all. Like no one pays attention to us. We're just expected to do everything that they ask us to do. Um, but we don't really have any backing or support from athletics. And we are so lucky that we have Michael Kelly here at USF and the rest of athletics that support us. And, you know, they give us all this like great gear and they give us all the support in the world. And it really helps, you know, it really helps us feel a little bit better. So we're not just doing what we do for nothing. We're appreciated and that feels really good. Okay, I only have one more question and it's just about the coronavirus again, because that's what okay. everyone's ever talking about. But you guys are facing a lot of challenges as so is, you know, all the other sports. And I just want to know, what does this mean for the future of the Sun Dolls, in your opinion? You know, the virtual meetings, the virtual conventions, you know, all this stuff thrown at you guys and you guys are overcoming it. What do you think that this will do for you guys? Um, I think maybe in the future, I think we might start doing these virtual meetings anyways, um, just because they have been really beneficial especially for the rookies. When I was a rookie, I got an email that told me, these are the sidelines you need to know. Here's a link to the videos, learn them. And when you come in on your first day of practice, you need to know them like the back of your hand. And that was really intimidating because you don't really know the veterans on the team. Like you, you may have interacted with them at auditions a little bit and you met some friends that are gonna be rookies, but you're moving to town for the first time. You don't know anyone. And you come into this practice and you're expected to look and act like you're a veteran when it's only your first day of practice. And I think having these little virtual meetings is making them feel a little bit more comfortable with us. Because I was scared. As a rookie, I was terrified of the veterans. Like, not that they were mean or scary, but like knowing I had to live up to the way they looked and the way they danced made me so intimidated and so scared that I was like, I like didn't even want to go full out because I was afraid I was going to mess up. But I think this is making them a lot more comfortable with the team, with the coaches, with the captains, and the material, everything. Um, so I hope that this continues these little virtual meetings because it's not like they audition in May and then immediately move to Tampa. Some of these girls don't come until school starts in the fall. So that's why we don't have practice until then. Um, as far as auditions, I'm, I feel like maybe we'd still have like in-person auditions but if someone weren't able to make it for like, you know, they had their own dance competition or something, maybe they could submit like a virtual audition and still have a chance to be on this team. Um, I don't know if the dance conventions are ever going to like go completely virtual, but I hope the dance world in general like offers, continues to offer these types of classes. Like a lot of big industry dance people are offering free classes because they know that people can't go to their dance studio and they can't, or they can't afford it right now because their parents don't have the income. So I hope that the dance industry in general continues to offer these free classes that are virtual online so that people can learn from the comfort of their homes if they don't have the resources. So I hope, I hope that's the case. But as far as everything else, I, I think everything will go back to normal eventually. Lauren, thank you so much for sharing with us and thank you so much for joining. I know I've learned a lot. We really appreciate it. We hope to see the Sun Dolls back out at USF football games soon. We're hoping things return back to normal. Again, thank you so much. Absolutely. I was so happy to do this. This was amazing. Thank you for having me. Well, that's our show. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think it was really cool to hear um, from Lauren Farr and to hear the the experience that the Sun Dolls are dealing with and um, we hope you enjoyed this sort of unique perspective on the on the coronavirus and we hope to get some more unique sort of content out like this and talk to a lot of different people um, so again I've been USF Oracle Sports Editor Nolan Brown and I'm Hannah Halili and like I mentioned in this episode don't forget to follow us on Twitter just to keep following more of our updates and keep up with everything going on in USF and Tampa sports and just in the area in general. Thanks again, and we'll see you guys next week.